So glad you're here. Pastor, last week, he began a series, and the series is what to expect when you're expecting. What to expect when you're expecting. Now, uh, he may have asked this last week. Does anybody here, how many here would have a copy of that book, or you've had a copy at some point? Anybody brave enough to admit that you had a copy? Come on. Come on. We've got several copies in the house. So, so if you want to sell those, if you would just bring, no, just, just kidding. I don't think we have any of those in the bookstore, but, but uh, if you're expecting, it's not, probably not a bad book to, to have in your portfolio. Uh, so last week, Pastor talked to us. Hey, Travis, good to see you and Hannah. God bless y'all. It's, it's, uh, he talked to us last week about, uh, you, you think, squirrel, right? Think I'm a little, think I'm a little AD, ADD or whatever they call it. I don't know. Uh, I get distracted maybe a little easy. Is that true? All right. So anyway, as I was saying, last week, Pastor talked to us about expecting. And that the mindset of the church has to be one of expectancy and faith and believing that God is going to do something in and through us. And so today, today, my assignment is preparing, preparing. So last week, expecting, today, preparing. So I want to talk to us for a little while today on preparing for the baby, preparing for the baby. Now, how many people here have ever brought home or brought into your life a new little baby? Anybody here? I mean, this is the time to show your hands. I mean, you you can stretch out right now, stretch out. Okay, a lot of people, a lot of people here have had this experience. So, man, you're going to be able to relate today that, matter of fact, I could probably cut this really short, and and we could, uh, no, let's go ahead and preach. All right. And so so what happens? I I remember when we went, man, man, old Sister Hannah, Sister Hannah, wave at the crowd for me. They're, that's my baby. That's my brown-eyed girl right there. All right, when we were getting ready for, for Hannah, oh, it was amazing now. It was amazing. It seems like everything just begins to shift. You know, you get that word, and, and uh, man, things in the house, I mean, they had been just fine for 11 years. I mean, no problem. Everything was fine. We were living in the house. Everything was good. Didn't really need to make any changes, upgrades. Ho, ho, ho. How did that change. I mean, we had to start looking at the house a little differently now. We had to start looking at it from the perspective of a baby because some of the stuff that would be no problem whatsoever for us might be a little bit of a problem for a newborn baby. So it it wasn't any longer what worked best for us. It was what was best for the baby, what protected the baby, what kept the baby. So that's what had to be, become our mindset. And so, uh, as a matter of fact, we, we, we had this home study done that they would come in and they would walk through your house and they would say, oh, no, you mean you don't have locks on your cabinets? <laughs> well, no, we've really not had a problem with anybody breaking into our cabinets. <laughs> so, so, oh, no, you've got to put locks on your cabinets. So we're, we're putting locks on the cabinets and, and hey, you've got... What if that dresser fell over? Well, you never really thought about that. Wife and I haven't been climbing on the dresser. And so, 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 so at some point, we, you know, you, you get this screwdriver and this wire, screw in the wall, hanging a wire to it, attaching to the dresser. I mean, you can't, you've got you to gotta think differently. When the baby's coming, you're thinking about crawling up the dresser. You're thinking about uh, breaking into cabinets. You know, they may find some poison in there to drink. And so you've got to be careful. Because a baby thinks differently than what an adult does. So it wasn't what worked best for us. It was what was best for the new baby. Outlet covers, cabinet door locks, securing dressers to the wall. And then there's this whole redecorating the room. Wow. I mean, that room had just been fine. I had my computer set up in there. Everything was fine. The paint was fine. The, the carpet was fine. The colors were fine. But no, no, no. No, that's not longer, no longer sufficient. Now, it's new furniture for the baby, and it's new paint color. We've got to go with a soft pink for my brown-eyed girl. We've got to get it just right. I mean, it's, we've got, oh, it's got to have a nice bed, not just some mattress laid in the floor. We've got to come up with a nice bed. And so, I mean, it was redecorated time. And, and, the, and the family's expanding, right? When you're having babies, the family is getting bigger. So now, now we had a room that had served perfectly well as an attic. I mean, we had all kind of junk in, that, in there. I mean, it was stuff in there we really didn't need, but we kept it. You know, you might need it sometime. And so we had all this stuff in there. Well, oh, no, no. We, we got to turn that room into living space. 
Oh, so now the clock is on. Now we're running with the gun. Now we, we got we to gotta hurry and get all this stuff done. Man, putting the hardwoods down, painting walls, having uh, drywall guys come in. It was a mess. And we're racing uh, the clock to get all this done before the baby arrives. Man, your world has changed. Your thinking changes. Your preparation changes. You stop thinking about you and you start thinking about that little baby. We're making room now for an addition. There were even areas that were affected that we weren't even prepared for. Now, you could think room. You could think, oh, there were, there were areas that we were. What about your relationship? Oh, I guess y'all are too proud to talk about how your newborn baby affected your relationship, but it's just like things change a little bit at home, if you know what I mean. You're no longer the most important person in the world. The little one is. So I'll get to you in a few weeks, if you're lucky. No, it, it, it wasn't that bad. But the, the relationship changes. You're thinking, hey, what just happened in my house? I mean, all we did was bring home this, this, this little seven, eight pound little child here. And now the world stops. Everything, I mean, now everything, now this is the center of the universe. Everything spins around this child. What just happened to my relationship? How about your social life? Anybody remember that? Like, oh, yeah, used to, man. You came and went when you want. You know, out with the friends, playing spades. You know, we're having a good time. No, not anymore. Not anymore because, I mean, now you got a little one. Oh, yeah, you, maybe, maybe you guys can come over next week. What, problem with my kid? Just because they scream and holler and want to be fed and poop all the time? You got a problem with that? So, so now all them invites are tapering off now because now you got, you got a little, little luggage that you carry around with you now. So, okay, your social life seems to diminish a little bit. But, but you, who has time for a social life anyway? I mean, after all, you're changing diapers and feeding babies and, and burping and trying your best to get them to sleep. And when you get a chance, you're catching a cat nap, right? I mean, any chance you can, it's like, okay, okay, I'm awake, I'm awake. So and your social life totally changes. You're like thinking, man, what has happened to the world? It's gone crazy. Time management? Oh, uh -huh. now you got to think about, what, 30 minutes ahead of everything? Because now you're just not getting you out the house. Now you got to get that car seat. I mean, it's one we all don't have bad, bad hips. But carrying like this thing, get things, you know, I don't know how much it weighs. The baby wasn't that heavy. This thing felt like, I don't know what mama put in there. But, so I mean, Time management, everything. Okay, can we go to the store? Have we got a window of opportunity to go to Walmart? Nope, I've done my figuring. I think we're going to miss it by 10 minutes. Sorry. You know, baby's got to have a bath tonight. Really? Everything changes because everything now begins to spin around the baby. So now let's shift our thoughts a bit. I had a little fun. Imagine me having fun. So we, we've talked a little bit about the natural, but isn't all this really true? We laugh because we've experienced it. It's true. A baby will change your life. It'll change your family dynamic. It will. That's what happens. And so let's look at what the Bible has to say about new babies, about little ones. It's in Matthew chapter number 18, and I'm going to begin reading with verse 1, and we'll read through 6. That would be six verses. Matthew 18, chapter, chapter 18, verse 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Did they have an issue with this or what? They're always wanting to know who's going to get your right side, who's going to be the best, who's the greatest. It almost sounds like humans today, right? I mean, really, I mean, who's your favorite? Have you ever heard kids talk about that? Who, who's your favorite? Oh, I know I'm the favorite. I mean, we're always, always trying to muscle our way to the top. Who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Bad question, but anyway. Verse 2, And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. And he said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of of heaven. Wow. Do you realize how he shifted the discussion right there? It's who's the greatest to, do you think you're going to make it? <laughs> I mean, who's the greatest? Well, unless you can somehow change your attitude and humble yourself, 
you might not even make it to heaven, much less being the greatest one there. That's kind of the response that they're getting. So I'm sure that their heads were spinning. So verse four is an important verse. It says, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child. So a little child, man, we get, we get full grown. You know, you can't tell us much. <laughs> we think we got this, don't we? I mean, we got the answers. A little child, they, they still wise enough or humble enough to actually accept correction, right? Now, they don't accept it good. I mean, they're going to cry. And, 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 but, hey, you give them five minutes, you're going to get a hug. I mean, they're going to be mad for about five minutes. They don't want you in looking at them. Don't, don't. You give them five minutes, tickle their feet a little bit. Oh, they all going to give you a hug. It's because they're, they're humble. They don't, they don't have an ego they're trying to protect. They're, they're just kids. And, and, and you correct them, and they get their feelings hurt, and they cry a while. And, and then, hey, let's tickle fight. Why not, right? It's kids. They're different. So whosoever, therefore, shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever, now get this, this is where we get into really the meat of what we, I think, can learn today. Whosoever shall receive one of such little children in my name receiveth me. If you can receive one of these little ones, so what little ones? What is he talking about here, receiveth me? But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believeth in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Now, if you want to read that in the, in the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible, uh, a little brings a little more clarity there, chapter 18, verse 6. But whosoever, or whoever, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to fall away, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung about his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. So you got this little one. And he said, you need to be cautious how you handle this little one. Because if you're offended, cause it to fall away, it would be better for you if you were gone. You'd be better off dead than to offend a newborn Christian. You say, well, he's talking about kids there. Oh, is he really? He said, whosoever there shall, therefore shall humble himself as this little child. He's telling us about newborn Christians here. He's using the analogy of a kid to explain to us the opportunity we have with newborn baby Christians. We need to wrap our minds around that. And we, we were fine as long as we were talking about babies. But now let's use that analogy in the Christian realm. And how does that shape who we are, how we think, and how we act? Let's face it. If we believe the words that have been spoken over this church or to this church in the last years, if we believe that those words spoken, prophecies if we call them, to, to be true, if we believe that, then this church should be expecting spiritual babies to be born. We should be expecting people to be coming to our facility. We should be expecting uh, new babies to be born, people accepting the Lord Jesus Christ and surrendering their life, humbling themselves to Christ and allowing him to fill their life and their new babies in Christ, which means they're having to learn who Jesus is and what does it really mean to follow Jesus, to humble myself, to put my will in the back seat, if not eradicate it, and say, now it's not about me anymore, but it's about Jesus, and I want to follow Jesus. Is there going to be some correction? Absolutely. That's what happens when there's kids. There's times of correction with kids. There's times of training with kids, but there's also got to be times of love and support and nurturing for kids. And so it's going to take a church that understands what it means to parent, to be a mother in order for us to appreciate what's going on. So the question to you today, are we prepared physically, socially, emotionally, and most of all, spiritually to care for new babies? Are we prepared to care for new babies? 
Are we prepared to disciple? Are we prepared to correct? Are we prepared to teach and to lead, to disciple? Are we prepared for that? You know what? How many people would, if you've raised a child, would raise your hand and tell you it's hard work and it takes a lot of energy to raise a child? Anybody agree with me? Hardest job I have ever done, bar none. Raising a child is the hardest job I've ever done, bar none. And so why are we, why is there a hesitancy in, in, our, in our spirit when we start talking like this? Because every one of us knows that sometimes kids are messy. Sometimes they take a lot of work. Sometimes they take a lot of discipline. And then all of them take a lot of love. And that's what makes a difference in being able to raise children that are healthy and that are hardy and that are strong. So are we prepared for this? We need to get prepared. What can we do to prepare for their arrival? What can we do collectively? What can we do as a body of Christ? And then what can we do individually to prepare? In other words, what can we do? And then what can I do or what can you do to prepare for newborn babies, for Christians that have just come to discover our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? So another question, can you and I, can we be trusted with newborn babies? Can we be trusted? If, if they were doing our uh, home study today, could we be trusted with newborn babies? Is, is this a safe environment? Is it a place where discipline uh, is, is, is safe? Is this a place where love is safe? Is this a place where we can, we can all agree that we want to make this environment conducive to a healthy baby? Okay, if you're going to do that, guess what? You're not going to like the locks on the cabinets. It's an extra thumb push, and sometimes if they don't... Well, you can off the wall. I mean, sometimes there's frustration in the changes that we have to make emotionally and even sometimes physically because it's not about us. We have to make sure that thought carries through, not just in the natural, but in the spiritual. There is work to be done. It's not about us anymore. And as a healthy, mature believer, we should have already discovered that. And most of us hopefully have. But if you haven't, hello. The alarm clock's going off. It's time to wake up and be a grown up. If you're a Christian, and you've been a Christian for some years, now if you're a newborn baby, we're going to love you. We're going to discipline you. We're going to burp you. We're going to feed you. That's what we do. To, oh, we're going to have to clean you up too. Mm. Well, that's the not so fun part, right? But this is what happens. And so we've got to get the mindset that if we, now granted, the, the other choice is not to have babies. Now, I'm not here to offend anybody. My wife and I struggle uh, with, with, with the pregnancy. We, we went 10, 12 years, wanted a child, didn't have one, and then my brown-eyed girl came along. And then shortly after that, hey, Levi, whoo, all right, enough said. And so, so, no, I got fantastic, fantastic children. And so, but the whole, the, the point of the matter is, are we ready for the work engaged and how it don't become about us anymore, but now it's about the children? Are we prepared for that? Are we prepared to sacrifice? Are we prepared to do the work? Are we prepared to roll our sleeves up? Are we prepared to parent? Are we mature enough to parent? Are you mature enough to parent? And then if, that's, if the answer is yes, then how's that going for you? <laughs> Who are you parenting? Who, who are you helping? Oh, you're a full-grown man now, but you ain't helping nobody? You ain't got no little ones? Come on. Come on. Let, let's let's be, have a mindset that we're wanting the house to get bigger. We're wanting to take out that junk out of the attic. We want to finish that attic. We're making more space. We're getting ready. Why? Because there are babies that need to be born because there's something about babies in the house. Now, I've talked about the bad stuff. How about the laughter? Huh? Man, if you could only sell... The, the juice that comes from baby's laughter. I mean, you, you, you look at the internet. If it ain't dogs, it's babies laughing, right? I mean, evidently people love dogs doing silly stuff and cats, and they love babies laughing. 
Because there's something about a baby's laughter. There's something about having a baby in the house. It, it brings energy. It brings life. And sure, it's a mess. But man, they're a hoot every second. And, and, and when you're not yelling at them, you're laughing at them. I mean, it's just kind of this odd dynamic. It's like, oh, I'm going to kill you. You're wonderful. Oh, I think I'm going to spank your tail. Oh, you're such a precious child. I mean, what, a, what kind of dynamic is this? We go from one extreme to the other. Like, man, I've got to wring his neck. Oh, isn't he precious? Because it's parenting. It's, it's dealing with a little one. They're not mature yet. They don't understand. They don't know what to do, what not to do. All they know to do is go. That's all they know to do. So here we are. Here we are. Can we be trusted with newborn babies? And if the answer to that in your life is no, if the answer to that in this church is no, then I'm going to make it really simple for you. We've got to change. That's all there is to it. I mean, it's, that's all there is. You've got to change. You've got to do something different. Well, they say the, key to it, the, the, the definition of insanity is doing something over and over the same way and expecting different results. Well, that doesn't happen. So if we're, if we're not having children, then we've got to change. And, and here, I, I hope this is not us. And I, I'm, in Jesus' name, I'm believing this is not us. But I want to ask this question anyway, just for thought-provoking. I'm going to make a statement. I hope we aren't so selfish or busy as to secretly or maybe subconsciously prefer barrenness over babies. Are, are we secretly or maybe subconsciously so busy that we would actually prefer barrenness? We would never say that. Oh, we want the church to grow. God, send us a hundred brand, uh, oh, I'm sorry, but send us a hundred mature people that already know how to tithe. <laughs> send them to us, God. Well, some babies come into your life full grown. Most don't. Thank, thank the Lord for those who come into our lives that are full grown. And God sends them to just be a support and a strength and a help to us. But most homes grow the hard way. It's through teaching, loving, and discipline and nurturing children. That's how most healthy families grow. So I want to ask you a question. This is for you. Do you really want kids? Or do they bother you? Do, do you really want kids? Not the, for all those that are, that are my age or older, or maybe 40. I'm not, I'm not saying literally. Because there's going to be a resounding no in the room. Uh, no, I'm done. I've got two beautiful children. Finished. Unless God performs the miraculous. And we're not praying for that miracle. So, do you really want kids? Or are they a bother to you? Now, let me bring some insight to that question. Because <laughs> I've kind of been on both sides of this fence. How many have been in a room full of kids and you are really ready to... And I, I, I gotta use my watch my language because I don't want to make people think that I'm violent. <laughs> but but you really want to gain the attention of those children, and sometimes more than you want to gain the attention of their children, you want to gain the attention of their parents. Mm -hmm. And so so here's the deal. Here's what I've discovered: when I was without children. And let me say, that was a fantastic season in our life, babe. That was a fantastic season. We're paying for it now, but it was a fantastic season. And so, I mean, I would be around children, and it's like, ah, okay, how long do we have to stay here? Okay, is it almost time? Okay, give me the signal when you're ready. All right, let's go. Man, you get in the car, and you're like breathing hard. What just happened, man? Was that a tornado we just came through? I mean, you're in, a, you're in a restaurant. Every peep you hear is like, do something with your child. It's like the child just said, Arr. it's like, I mean, it's like, what is going on? Kind of like them teachers that, and the, the bells, if they're here, they'll appreciate this. The, the teachers that are old maids and never had kids, oh, they're hardcore. 
Get in line, boy. What do you mean? They've never had kids. I mean, sometimes, if you ain't, but hey, isn't there something different when they're your kids? Well, your kids can be running, dancing on the table in the restaurant. <laughs> you're like, you're oblivious. Man, isn't this good macaroni? Mm. Honey, I don't know if I've had chicken like this in a few months. <laughs> this is good stuff. Oh, Junior, calm down a little bit. Turn it down just a little bit. You know, you're fine. Give that boy another crayon. <laughs> he needs something to write with. I mean, all of a sudden, they're your kids now, right? When your kid, all your kids, man, you can be in somebody's house. Hey, they're pulling the wallpaper off the wall, stripping the beds. Come on. Man, piling the mattresses up. We're going to jump on the mattresses. Oh, y'all don't break nothing. <laughs> Boy, aren't them kids something? They're precious, ain't they? Precious children. But here's the pres- perspective difference. The perspective difference is they're yours. Did you catch that? So maybe you have a problem with children being around because they're not yours. And you might be acting a little different toward the kids if you had some of your own. It makes you a little bit more patient and kind. Oh, there's the bells. You like that little spot I give you? Thank you. Hope, hope she's not watching, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and so... so well, I hope she is, but I hope if so, she don't know who I'm talking about. A little inside joke, me and, me, and, me and Steve. All right. Where was I, Steve? Anyway, I was somewhere. Uh, it was a great point, too. I'm sure. Okay, let me just go back to my notes. It's safer that way. <laughs> it's a difference when they're your own. Thank you, Billy. I was getting there. And so the, the, so the answer to it is have some of your own. When you have some children of your own, it changes the way you see children in general. I mean, us and the Kellogg's, come, I mean, not the Kellogg's, the Kennedys. The Kellogg's, are y'all here? I wasn't talking about y'all. Okay. If you're watching online, I still wasn't talking about you. So the Kennedys, we're crazy enough. We'll take their four wonderful, fantastic children, and we'll couple it with our two fantastic children, and we'll go on a trip together. And you'll go into places where other adults are, and you let them run. <laughs> Hey, this is great. Hey, don't y'all get no stranger. Take you home. They'll bring you back real quick. <laughs> and so, I mean, we, we, but here's the deal. When you have kids of your own, something about kids, it's not a big deal anymore. Is that true to the Walmers? I mean, you, you've had a few kids. I mean, come on. So if you have kids, you can appreciate that. All of a sudden, being around kids, it's, it's not a big issue anymore. So I'm going to ask you in the spirit realm. Have some kids. If you have some kids that you're disciplining, you're burping, you're feeding, you're changing, you're working with, you're training, you're discipling, then guess what? You're not going to be as hyper-focused on everybody else's kids because you're going to be fully busy with kids of your own. And if you're busy with kids of your own, then you're going to be fully busy and you don't have time to worry about everybody else's children. And so I'm encouraging every single one of us to change our mindset about children by having some kids of our own in the spirit. Have somebody you're pouring into. Have somebody you're discipling. Have somebody that it matters to you if they're going to show up at church on Sunday. Have somebody that you you call, that you check on, that you care about, that you look out for. Have somebody in your life that you're helping to bring along on this spiritual journey, that you're invested in them, that, yeah, it's work, but you love it because the relationship is worth it every time. So, so maybe it's not just about the baby being born, as great as that is. Maybe something is being birthed in you as well. So maybe it's not just the babies that are coming that we've got to be preparing for. But maybe, just maybe, something's being birthed in you this morning. Some light bulbs are going off. Some desires are being kindled. Some passions are being reignited about what it means to really serve God and to invest in the kingdom, which is investing in people, investing in little ones and babies and new baby Christians. So maybe, just maybe, something is being birthed in you today. So let me ask you this question. 
Are you preparing for what God wants to do in you and through you? He didn't bring you to the kingdom for nothing. He wants to do something in you. He wants to do something through you. Each person in this room, God has a plan for you. In, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, this is from the New Living Translation. So for all you guys that struggle, just think about sheep right now or something like that. Philippians 2, 13 in the New Living Translation. For God is working in you giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. You see that? It's not what pleases you, but he's given you a desire. He's given you a passion to do what pleases him. In other words, the more we allow Christ in us, it's not about us. It's not about the me show. It's about Jesus. It's not about what I I, me, or or mine. It's about Jesus. It's about his kingdom. And so God is working in you, giving you the desire, giving you the desire, the passion and the power to do what pleases him. And so we've got to pray for that. God, I want a desire to see babies born. I want a desire for parenting in the spirit realm. I want a desire to be a nurturer and yes, a discipliner and yes, a teacher, but God, a lover of people. I want that desire to be rekindled in my soul, to be rekindled in my spirit, to see someone and to know that they're hurting and to be able to reach out a hand and say, hey, can I pray with you today? Or hey, is there something that we can do? Hey, do you know Jesus? Hey, have you ever been to church? Hey, would you like to come with me? Let's start having those feelings, those emotions, those words framed in our spirit and in our mouths. Are we preparing for what God wants to do in you and through you? And it's going to take a relationship with God because it's selflessness is what parenting is about. It's not about us. It's about the baby. And so we've got to get over ourselves. If we want to accomplish what God has got planned for you individually and for us corporately, get over yourself and allow God's plan and desire to be implemented in your life. You guys can stand. I know you're thinking you're supposed to go long, but I'm just, you know... Being kind to you today and trying to be a good parent, right? So maybe today you're a little confused and you don't really even understand what this old boy from Greenbar is talking about. I mean, you ain't never had no baby and you don't want no baby and you're confused out of your mind. I came to church. Is this Lamont's? Where am I at? All right. I've got a little help for you too. See, maybe, just maybe, you're the baby We've been preparing for. Maybe you're the baby. So, let me ask you a question. If that's you today, like you, you really kind of sketchy. I don't know where this guy's going with this. I'm going to make it real simple for you right now. Have you been and are you ready to be born again? If you've never been born again, are you ready for that this morning? Because that's your message today. Where do we get that? Well, John wrote about it in his book, in the third chapter, in the third verse. It says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So if you want to see the kingdom, if you want to be a part of God's kingdom, if you want to be saved, guess what? You have to be born again. So what does that look like, you may ask? Well, we've got a couple of scriptures that we can frame, but one of the easy ones, uh, when, when the, the, the day of Pentecost, man, they had just had a uh, revival church, I mean, it broke out and people speaking in tongues, uh, having themselves at the time, people, they were acting so silly, people thought they were drunk. And, and so they were speaking different languages and all this was going on. And so they said, men and brethren, what must we do? Because he had just preached to them Jesus Christ. He had talked to them about how Jesus is your solution. The one you crucified, oh yeah, you put him in the grave. Oh he, yeah, by the way, he did rise three days later and he's still alive. He's victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Yeah, that Jesus, he, he, you, you killed him. And so now they're stunned. 
They've realized their humanness. They've realized their need for Jesus because he's preached Jesus to them. Jesus is your answer, by the way. Whoever you are, wherever you are, if you're out there on the web somewhere, Jesus is your answer. He is your answer. And so it, it, they said, what, what, what are we going to do? We've, we've already messed up. We've done something uh, terrible. We've, we've crucified the, the Lord. He said, well, he said, I want you to repent. What does that mean? Repent means to change the way you think and live. It's not just remorse. Remorse leads to repentance. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I've acted like such a blooming idiot my entire life. I'm sorry that I've done things my silly self way my whole life. I'm sorry I've hurt people. I'm sorry I've destroyed things. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But it's, it's not just about being sorrow. But godly sorrow does work repentance. And so it's, it's one thing to be sorry. It's another thing to say, I'm not going to be that person anymore. I'm going to change the way I think. That's true repentance. It's changing. Changing the way you process life, the way you think. That's repentance. So he said repent, which I was, he used the word re repent, but man, there was a whole sermon there, I'm sure. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of those sins. In other words, I want you to get into a pool of water and I want you to be immersed. Baptism is to be immersed. I want you to go all the way under the water. I want you to be immersed in water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of all those sins. I want to eradicate those sins. Remove them from your slate. Give you a brand new clean slate. He said, if you'll repent, you'll change the way you think and live. And you'll be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of those sins. And you shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. He said, this promise is unto you. It's to your children. It's to as many, all that are far off. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That includes us. So everybody here today, the invitation is wide open to you. If you have never been born again, hopefully today you've got a room full of people that are ready to be parents. Hopefully today we've got a renewed commitment to parenting at Gullisville Pentecostal Church, and we're just waiting and expecting, but yet preparing for someone to give their life to Jesus and say, Jesus, I give myself to you. I'm going to do it your way this time. Please forgive me and lead me. And I want to be yours completely. So, if you'll do that, there's a fantastic promise for us all. I want to read one more verse. It's in 1 Corinthians. This was Paul writing to the church that was at Corinth in his first letter to them. Chapter 2, verse 9. He said, but as it is written... Get this now. This is what we, we've got a promise here, folks. I have not seen, <laughs> nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Did you get that? It's hard for us to wrap our brains around that, that he is going away to prepare. You're talking about preparing? God is preparing for his family. He's going away to prepare a place for you. And if you went away, he said, I will come again. He's coming back. I've heard that my whole life. Well, that must mean it's closer than it was the first time you heard it. Because he is coming back. Deny it if you want to. You're not going to keep it from happening. Stick your head in a hole if you want to. But he's still coming. You'll just be caught with your head in a hole. But... If we will surrender to him, it says, I have not seen, ear hadn't heard, it hadn't even entered into your heart what I have prepared for you. God has got something great for his people. God's got something great for his kids, for his family. And if we will just keep on loving and, and caring and sharing, God's got a great place reserved for us. And oh, I'm so thankful this world is chaotic. The pressure is high. Anxiety seems to be at an all-time high. People are doing things that you wouldn't dream about doing. But guess what? God's on the throne. God's preparing us a place. It's going to be great. Heaven's going to be worth it all. Every long mile, it's going to be worth it. Just keep walking. Just keep loving. Just keep caring. Just keep sharing. It's going to be worth it all. So here's, here's the way we're going to close today. First of all, if you've never been born again, obviously if you're here, you've been born the first time. I want somebody who hadn't been born the second time. 
and you want to give your life brand new to Jesus Christ. And if that's you today, then you've came to the right church at the right time. And we're asking you, first of all, if you want to, be, if you want to give your life to Christ, then you can come right now. But ahead of everybody else, you get to first dibs. You get to come to the front. And there will be people that will join you. If you want prayer, they'll pray with you. They'll help you understand what, what the steps of repentance all what that really means. They can walk through it. And if you haven't been born again, you can't say, if you leave this place, you can't say, I didn't have a chance. When you, when you stand before God, uh, you can't say, well, I didn't know. I didn't have a chance to do that. No, because, uh, you know, he's got a perfect memory. And he can uh, flash this up in your brain just like that. So you've had your, you had, you got an opportunity today, and we hope that you take advantage of it. But if that's not you, and, and at any time you can come. So you, you got dibs, you can come. But if you want to recommit to parenting, or maybe just ask God to change your heart, to change your mind, you're just honest enough to say, I don't want kids. I don't want spiritual babies. They're too messy. They're too much work. We've got to change. So the way you change is you come and you ask God, God, change my heart. Let me, let me think differently. I want to repent. I want to start the, 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 the change in my life today. I want to begin with the decisions I make today. And so I'm asking you, if, if you have struggled uh, preferring barrenness over babies, I want you to make that commitment, that decision today that, that you're going to surrender your life to him, that it's not about you, it's about the babies and to everybody else. So there's a wide blanket today. And if you want babies and you want to come and you want to say, I'm doing two things as I come, I'm asking God to let, to let expectancy permeate our very spirit and let preparedness permeate who we are and start praying for babies to come into your world. If you're brave enough to pray any of those prayers, these altars are open. To ask God to do something inside of me that makes me hunger for babies, that makes me desire babies, that wants me to love somebody, to bring somebody to Jesus, to let them know the joy we feel and the hope that floods through our spirits, and to let them know that there is a place that's being prepared for those who will serve our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So you can come today and you can give your life to Christ. You can come today and renew your commitment to, to parenting them, that you're going to touch somebody's life in your world that you're going to change what's necessary. You're going to make changes in, in the areas of your life that's necessary to bring children because it's not about us. It's about the kids. Oh, Jesus, I pray that you help us today. God, let our hearts and our minds be challenged by your spirit. God, let us be prepared for children to be born into the kingdom. God, let our perspective change about everything we see and everything we do. God, let it not be about us, but let it be about the kids. Our preferences, our pettiness, God. I pray that we will bury that, God, to, to make way for a generation of people that need to hear about Jesus and need to surrender their lives to him and they need people to help them and they need trainers and they need people to love them and to share with them and to hold their hand god help us to be hungry for new babies let us hunger for new babies let us hunger today in the name of jesus christ in the name of jesus christ in the name of jesus christ